In this video, we're going to talk about antiderivatives, and I'm going to spell it correctly. What is an antiderivative? Well, it's a function, and a function capital F of x is called an antiderivative of lowercase f on interval i, provided that capital F prime of x equals f of x for all of x in the interval. In other words, if we're looking for an antiderivative of a lowercase function f, we're looking for a different function whose derivative is the same as lowercase f. So an example would be if I have a function lowercase f of x equals x, well, its antiderivative could be one half x squared. But since the derivative of a constant is zero, another possible antiderivative would be one half x squared minus three. Take the derivative of one half x squared, I'll get x, the derivative of minus three is zero. And so on, another antiderivative would be one half x squared plus radical two. In fact, the most general antiderivative would be capital F of x equals one half x squared plus c, where c is any constant. So let's look at some more examples. Sine of x. Think about sine of x. What function has a derivative equal to sine of x? Well, we don't know any. We know that the derivative cosine is negative sine of x. So uh, cosine is close. It's just off by the, the sine. And so we need to put a negative sign in front of cosine. So the antiderivative of sine of x is negative cosine of x. And with antiderivatives, you can always check. You can always just say, okay, let me go ahead and take the derivative If I take the derivative of negative cosine of x, well, that would be negative negative sine of x, uh, which is going to just give you sine of x. So we know that that negative cosine of x is an antiderivative. All right, antiderivative of cosine of x. Ah, oh, well, this one is easier. The, we know that the derivative of sine is cosine of x, so the antiderivative of cosine is sine of x. Here we have a power, x raised to the power of n. Now, we have a power rule for derivatives, so we should be able to come up with a power rule for antiderivatives. Let's think about the steps that we take when we apply the power rule for derivatives. The first step is you multiply by the old exponent. So the n comes out in front as a multiplier. You subtract 1 from the uh, old exponent to get the new exponent. So two steps there. So to come up with an antiderivative rule, we should do the opposite. That is, we're going to do the opposite steps and in the opposite order. So the first step has to undo our second derivative step. So instead of subtracting 1, we're going to add 1 to the old exponent to get the new exponent. And then instead of multiplying by the old exponent, we're going to divide by the new exponent. And so the formula is x to the power of n plus 1 over the power of n plus 1. Uh, but really, we want to think of it in terms of these steps. We want to add 1 to the exponent and then divide by the new exponent. 
So if I have radical x, I can write that as x to the power of 1 half. And now I can apply this power rule for antiderivatives. I will take 1 half and add 1 in the exponent. Then I'll divide by that new exponent, 1 half plus 1. So I'll have x to the power of 3 halves over 3 halves. And then we are going to remember that dividing by a fraction is the same as multiplying by its reciprocal. And with practice, we don't do any of these intermediate steps. We just write that, oh, I know that 1 plus a half is 3 halves. The reciprocal of 3 halves is 2 thirds. That is my antiderivative. And then the most general one, I'll have to add a constant. Okay, secant squared of x, we recognize that as the derivative of tangent of x. Uh, secant x tangent x, again, we recognize that as the derivative of secant x. And finally, if I just have a constant, what's the antiderivative of a constant? Well, the constant could represent the slope of a line, so the antiderivative would be just that uh, constant times x or whatever variable you're using at the time. Let's look at this graphically. We're given the graph of f of x, and we'd like to sketch its antiderivative. So really what we're doing is giving the graph of a derivative, and we'd like to look at the graph of the original function. So I'm going to draw this on a set of axes directly below. Now, remember with my antiderivative, I don't really know where it's going to lie uh, in terms vertically. I don't know what any of its y coordinates will be because I can take an f prime, the antiderivative, and add a constant so and get a different antiderivative. So, but this, the one that I draw, the graph that I draw, will be an antiderivative. It's not, there is no unique the antiderivative. It is just simply an antiderivative. All right, so how am I going to do this? I'm going to be sketching the graph of a function given the sketch, the sketch of its derivative. Well, I know that when the derivative is positive, what does that mean for the original function? The original function is increasing. When the derivative is negative, the original function is decreasing. And where the original, where the derivative is zero, then the original function has a local max or min. So I'm really going to pay attention to these zeros of the derivative. And so, because I know that I'll have, well, let's just go ahead and make a note of that. Um, at this point, f goes from decreasing to increasing. From decreasing to increasing. And so that's going to correspond to a local min. Here, the function goes from increasing to decreasing. This has got to be a local max. And then over here, I need another local min. So if I just, again, where, what the y coordinate is, I don't know. But I'm going to go ahead and sketch a local max right here. And over here, I'm going to sketch a local min. And over here, I'm going to sketch another local min. And now look, I put the local mins below the local max uh, so that I know that I am going to go be increasing then between here and here. And I'll try to draw that as smoothly as possible. And then I should be decreasing. 
then go back to increasing. And on this side, um, yeah, F is decrease, like that. And so this would be a rough sketch of an antiderivative of the function shown above. All right, our last topic is acceleration, velocity, and position or displacement because the uh, antiderivative of acceleration is velocity and the antiderivative of velocity is position. So if I'm given that the acceleration of gravity is negative 32 feet per second squared, We'd like to find the equation for s of t when an object is falling under the influence of gravity, ignoring all other physical attributes. And we're given that the initial velocity is some generic v sub zero or v naught. And initial position is s sub zero at time zero or s naught. So we start off with the acceleration being constant. So we find the antiderivative. Remember, the antiderivative of a constant is just a constant times the variable. Uh, and then, of course, we need to add some constant there uh, as well. And so uh, we need to find the value of that constant in terms of the information given to us. So I know that when uh, t equals zero, the velocity is the given v naught, which means then if I put zero in for t here, the negative 32 times zero drops out and I'm just left with c1. So my c1 here is just going to be the initial velocity v naught. So that says that v of t is negative 32t plus v naught. Now take that antiderivative to find the position function. So the antiderivative of t, we'll have to use the power rule. So I'll add one, get t squared in the exponent, and then divide by that new exponent two, and I'm still being multiplied times negative 32. Uh, v naught is some constant, so its antiderivative is V naught times T, and then I need to add another constant. So working that out uh, in terms of the arithmetic, I get negative 16 T squared plus V naught plus C two. So I'd like to know what this constant c sub two is. So I use this initial condition that when t equals zero, uh, the position is s naught. And so when I put zero in for t, negative 16 times zero squared is zero. v naught times zero is zero. And the only thing that's left over is c two. And c two then must be s naught. So my formula becomes s of t equals negative 16t squared plus v naught t plus s naught.